All right. So if you are a very organized person, um, you probably have, you know, nice little labels and wonderful things in your notes. If you want to transition in your notes from chapter 51, which is where we were, to chapter 53, which is where we are, that would be a great place uh, to actually put, put that transition right there. 53. 53. 53. Yeah, Tori. Now, it's chapter 53 in our current textbook, which half of you have. It is not chapter 53 in the textbook that we'll move to, but I don't know exactly what chapter it is. It's in the high numbers as well. All right. So population ecology. Does anybody know what ecology is? Do you remember this from your biology class, how you define ecology? Yeah. Study of the ecosystem. Okay, and that would be like ecology proper, right? The study of an ecosystem. And ecosystems, what makes up ecosystems? Yeah. The animals that live in it. And? The food that they eat. And? The environment. Yes, and, and, and key aspects of that environment around them is it's not all living, right? So an ecosystem includes everything living in a particular place and everything non-living in an entire place. And you're like, well, what is non-living? And it's like, well, this, you know, the soil, at least parts of it, because there are living materials inside of the soil, right? The climate uh, the nutrients and how they move, all of that goes into ecology. So ecology proper is the study of ecosystems. But within that, we can break it up into little pieces. And so population ecology is going to be the study of populations. Okay, the study of populations and in, uh, in how they relate to their environment. And then, it, you know, it'll tell you including, don't worry about writing this. Remember, said, you know, don't worry about writing everything down, just write the key concepts. This just tells you some of the factors involved in population ecology. But guess what? We're gonna talk about these factors individually so you don't, you don't need to write them all down. So population ecology, study of populations in relation to their environment, right? We gotta start off with some terms though. So population ecology is the study of populations. What on earth is a population? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, Mark. Like a population is like an entire grouping of like different species of animals. Yes. Yep, absolutely. And so a population is a group of all of the individuals of a species living in the same general area. Add to this at the same time. At the same time. And you're like, well, of course, it has to be at the same time. That should go without saying. But it becomes very interesting when instead of studying living populations, you're studying populations buried in some kind of, you know, event that you're looking at fossils of, right? So just add at the same time, that way if you're doing paleontology rather than field biology, you still are getting this idea. So population group of individuals of a single species living in the same geographical area. A single species, that is really key. Make sure you write that down, single species. Because if there's more than one species, we're no longer talking about a population. We're talking about something else. Do you remember what that something else is? Is that ecosystem? No, so ecosystem, you have to add in the, the non-living parts as well, but in between the two. So when you're still only dealing with living parts, but it's more than one species. Anyone remember? It's called the community. The community, anyways. All right. Any questions? Happy Friday, by the way. I don't think I mentioned that before. Thanks. Fridays are wonderful days. We do. All right. So a um, couple of other terms, and then we'll start getting into the actual 
the 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 meat of the meal, right? Rather than just like all these terms, it feels like are just the 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 plates and the cups and stuff. So let's let's get through these terms, and then that way we can start putting some food on our plates. So density, the number of individuals per unit area or volume if you're dealing with uh, aquatic organisms. So density and number of individuals per unit area. And then the last term that we need to define, dispersion. Dispersion is a pattern of spacing. How are the individuals of the population distributed in their particular population? Okay. Dispersion. All right. And I know it's wonderful. Everybody loves just going through definitions. But relax. There were only four. You know? Gosh, you guys are, you guys are tough. <laughs> you guys are tough today. It's like no response at all. Just stone faces. Stone faces and moving hands. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. All right, so now we have some questions. We have some questions. How do we figure out the density, right? So we're like, okay, well, density is the number of individuals per unit area or volume if they're aquatic forms. But how do we figure that out? How do we count the number of individuals? Because a lot of times this can be really challenging. And why, why would it be challenging to determine the density of some populations? Give me an example or give me a why and then maybe an example. Yeah. yeah maybe they can be related, so it's right. So it's hard to see them, right? Let's say you're trying to figure out the density of, I don't know, bacteria living inside your gut. Man, that's going to be challenging because, I don't know, this is an FYI, there are almost as many bacterial cells in your gut as there are human cells in your entire body. It's a lot. a lot. It's a lot. And they're teeny tiny. Yeah, it is a lot. And then we'll come over here. Um, maybe they move around a lot like fish. Yeah, and so it can be hard. Did I count them more than once, right? Have you ever tried to count something that's moving? It's really frustrating. It's really frustrating, right? Did I count that individual already? Who knows? Yeah, Mark. Um, when you're like, like, like when they're moving in like in like a like a hard to see environment or like or something. Right. Yeah, so they may not be small, and they may not be moving so rapidly you don't know how many you've counted, but it may be really difficult to actually see them. And so uh, in, in most uh, cases, it's actually incredibly difficult to get an accurate count. And so instead what we do is give an estimation or provide an estimate of the total population size, and therefore an estimate of the density. And the most common way we do this is called the mark recapture. Mark recapture. Mark recapture. Somebody, somebody explain that term for me. You probably notice that we've got this, we've got this hyphen here, right? This hyphenated word. And so we've got two words. We've got mark and we've got recapture. What does mark mean? Yeah. Yeah, right? We've got a note that we've already counted them. And so if you're trying to count fish moving around in water, you mark them in some way to know you've already counted that fish, that individual. Good. What about the second part of this hyphenated word? What does it mean to recapture something? Yeah, Tori. Like recapture it? Yeah, you catch them again, right? So you had to catch them initially to mark them. And then it gives you this idea that you've released them because if you don't release them, you can't recapture them, right? Does that make sense? And now just by looking at the structure of this word, we should have a pretty good idea of how you actually do this, right? We've got to capture them, mark them in some way, we've got to release them, and then we've got to recapture them, right? We all good? Yes, all right. Sir. It's like the fiddler crabs, right? You can do mark recapture work on fiddler crabs. Nice thing is crabs are, they're really dumb and they're not super fast, they're quick. Like they go from zero to top speed fairly quickly, but they're not super fast. 
and that massive claw makes it really difficult for them to get hidden into burrows. All right, so let's talk about this mark recapture. So we, 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 we capture them, we mark them, we release them, and then we recapture another collection of the population. And so the way we actually use this to estimate the population is using this equation here. Wow, that green is really difficult to see. Let's try this one. Oh, that's way better. That is way better. Okay, so here's our calculation. So we already, we already went through, okay, mark, recapture. We knew that we had to capture in order to mark. And then if we're going to recapture, we had to release, right? So we were already there. Even before this came up, we're like, we're already there. But now a key here is you have to give time for these marked individuals to mix back with the rest of the population. So you don't want to do your recapture right away, right? It's like you dump your marked fish back into the lake and then you immediately capture them again, right? You want to give them some time to mix. Yeah, Tori. Wait, so this equation is for the population size? Yes, this is to estimate the population size. So in right here, good. That's our estimate of the population size. So we can use that to estimate density. And then in right here is the number of individuals in our, in, that are captured in the second time, this SN, the number of individuals when we do our recapture. And then X is the number of those individuals that were marked, right? X marks the spot. Look at that. Look at that. It's like pirates, but scientific pirates. <laughs> See, I got something. I got something. Thank you. Yeah, so these are, no, SN, these are the total number of individuals that you captured in your second. In, well, in S and N together are the total number of individuals. No. So then it's the total population. Yeah, it should say in parentheses here SN because it's the second or the sample N. Okay, so let me give you an example. Let's actually, let's, let's put some numbers here and then we'll alleviate some of the confusion. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, let's do something. Oh, let's, let's do something fun. Let's do something fun. Let's say you're trying to estimate the number of, I don't know, blue whales in the entire ocean, okay? And you're like, wow, this is, this is a fun thing because you're like, these blue whales are huge. By the way, blue whales are the biggest animal that has ever existed on this planet. Bigger than dinosaurs. Bigger than any species of dinosaur that's ever existed. Blue whales are the biggest animal that has ever lived on this earth. They can be up to 30 meters in length, which each meter is three and a quarter feet-ish. And so you're talking about somewhere around 100 feet in length and can weigh an enormous amount, I forget. I mean, they're just huge. They are huge animals. So you're like, oh, it shouldn't be hard, right? They're big, we're gonna find them. And then you're like, wow, the ocean is massive. Have any of you ever been on a cruise and you do a day at sea and you're like, I didn't see a single ship in the entire day at sea. And it's wild, right? It's just a massive place. And so, okay, so we're gonna do a mark recapture. And let's say over a year long period, uh, scientific vessels that are working on various projects, they just happen to mark over a year-long period, I don't know, let's say they mark 50 blue whales. So X is equal to 50. Over a year-long period of this initial capture, and you're like, well, why didn't they do the capture all at one time? Because these are massive animals. It's really hard. And you're like, well, year, that's a long time. It's true, but not for a massive mammal, right? Massive mammals have really long generation times takes the individuals a long time to reach sexual maturity, right? And so it's actually not all that long. Plus, blue whales only reproduce on average like every three or four years because it's very expensive for a male blue, a male, a female blue whale to raise and nurse a baby blue whale. They drink like 200 gallons of milk a day. And you're like, well, that's a massive animal, 200 gallons of milk, I mean, that's a lot. But it's a massive animal, but it's very expensive. It's a very expensive process to feed a developing blue whale. Okay, so over a year-long period, we capture and mark 50 blue whales. Yeah? Wait, so um, if it's really expensive, why is it just a natural, like, 
Oh, I mean, it, it's what I expensive meaning it requires a lot of energy for oh. the females. Not that it's causing. Okay. Yeah, they, as far as I know, they've never successfully uh, r raised even a baby uh, baleen whale, any type of baleen whale, including blue whales, in captivity. That would just be, I mean, it would be, how do you get 200 gallons of blue whale milk a day to give, and you're just like, oh, we'll give it cow's milk instead. <laughs> that's, that's tough. That's tough. They, I mean, we do, we've raised a lot of toothed whales in captivity, so dolphins, porpoises, and even small toothed whales, but as far as I know, we've never successfully uh, raised a baleen whale in captivity. Yeah? Do whales not have teeth? Uh, baleen whales do not. Baleen whales do not have teeth. They have baleen, which are like f plates of almost like fingernail material Is in their mouth. Is that like when Nemo got like sucked in? Yes, that was a baleen whale. But it was Nemo's dad, yeah. Marlin and, uh, and Dory. Yeah. All right, so over this initial period, we mark 50 individuals, okay? And then we allow those blue whales to remix with their population, and we give them five years. Five years before we do our recapture, okay? And you're like, five years, that's a really long time. But again, you need to think, these are massive mammals, long generation times, okay? So after five years, we take a second sample that occurs over a year-long period, okay? And we happen to, oh, s sorry, sorry. Ooh. Anyways, this should not have been X. This, this, this should not have been X. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Let's call this marked. That is, that, that, yeah, I know, but this is just the number of individuals in your sample that are marked. Not the total you marked initially. I did, a, I did a horrible, horrible injustice to your educational progression right there. Okay? So now let's go. I know. It's, it's terrible. It's inexcusable. So now after this five-year period of mixing, we take a second sample, and we collect during that year-long period 60 blue whales. Okay? 60 blue whales during that year-long period. We find them, um, different research vessels. Yeah. Is that SN? SN, yep. Yep. Like yes, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Isn't it just N to capture a second animal? Yes, well, so I, I'm just, I'm just uh, replacing this. But yeah, you, you could do N or SN. It's just telling you it's differentiating it from this N. In addition to it being lowercase, it's telling you that it's, it's a sample. Okay, so during this year-long period, we capture, and of those 60, five of them were marked, okay? So of those 60 whales that over that year-long period got recaptured, five of them had been marked during the previous work. What about the other? The other 55 were new individuals. The other 55 were new individuals. Either they weren't there to begin with, which is unlikely, Right? Or they were there to begin with and you just didn't see them or capture them during that initial period of capture. Um, yeah? Shouldn't the first thing be S? So the marked uh, 50 should be S? And then N should be 60? Uh, okay. Yes. Be yes. Yep, so this is... Thank you. Now we'll, we'll get this all... We'll get this all situated. Okay. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, I know. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I told you I did a sig serious injustice, but Katie has fixed it. Right? Luckily, we have Katie. Okay. Luckily, we have Katie. Yes. All right. <sighs> okay. Now we're in a good position. Okay. Now moving from here. Okay. So here, our initial period of collection. 50 individuals, okay, that were marked and released, okay? Second period of capture, we captured 60 individuals. Of those 60, five of them had been marked in the previous. Okay, now we're okay. Yeah. All right. Sure? Yes. Okay. Yes, I think we're in a good position now. We are in a good position now. I told you, I don't know, maybe it was Wednesday or it was Monday, jokingly I said I don't make mistakes. And that is clearly not true. Okay. <laughs> You probably knew it wasn't true then, and now your hypotheses have been confirmed. All right, so now, 
our number, our estimate of our population, number of initial marked individuals, times our number of collected individuals in our second one, divided by five, okay? Yeah, so now this would be 300 divided by five. This would be 3,000. Look at there was another one. 3,000 divided by five, which would be 600. Okay? All right, so now we have estimated the total number of blue whales. We don't know if there are exactly 600. In fact, we're pretty certain there aren't exactly 600, but we should have a fair estimate of it because 600 should be really close to the total number that there actually are. Even though we know it's not exact, it should be pretty close to the actual, especially if we do this a second time and we come up with an estimate that's really close to our initial estimate. Yeah, Emma. Did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. I know I just, I, I totally, I, I, I messed everything up. But hopefully Katie has fixed it and we're all, we're all where we should be. Are we all where we should be? Has Katie fixed everything that went wrong? Well, it's not, but you already did it. You already did it. There's no pressure. Okay. All right. Okay. So, now we're okay. So this is how we can estimate density. All right, we're gonna, I'm gonna give you uh, an observation to make. We're gonna take a little. All right. Okay, so before, <laughs> Before we did our break and talked about this whole idea of relatedness, and it wasn't really, well, I guess we actually did take a break, but even before we did the lecture break, uh, we talked about the density portion. How do we estimate population size so we can estimate population density? And now we need to talk about the dispersion. And so this is just basically how are the organisms distributed, okay? And again, that's the key aspect of dispersion. There's nothing on this slide that you need to write down because it's all gonna be right here. So basically three main uh, dispersions uh, with, with populations, okay? The first one is clumped, and that's that these organisms is exactly like it sounds. They are clustered for some reason, okay? So clumped is one type of distribution. Here you can see sea stars clumped together, yeah. Dispersion of individuals. Okay. Yeah, dispersion of individuals in a population. So we have clumped, and you see, do you see it, that they're clumped together? It's nice, when, when the term actually represents the reality, that's good stuff. That's and then here's uniform, and it's basically they are spaced evenly in this area, and then here's random, and you're like, wow, that's so random. I don't even see anything. It's it's the wildflowers. So, yeah, the flowers, the yellow flowers. I'll give you bigger versions of all of these images. So here's clumped. Okay, same same picture, just bigger. See you you see the sea stars? They're clumped. Now, what might lead to clumped patterns? Yeah. Okay, maybe they're huddling together to stay warm. In this case. They're probably not staying together to stay warm. They're probably staying together to stay moist, to reduce water loss. To reduce water loss. Yeah. For protection and like safety, maybe. Yeah. Right. And you see this? That's called the selfish herd, when animals will cluster together just to make it less likely they get eaten. The selfish herd. They use each other exactly. And the biggest, strongest individuals are, they tend to be not right in the middle because that's where the resources are poorest and not right on the outside because that's where you're most likely to be eaten, but somewhere in the middle, okay? That's another story for another time. So yeah, they're either clustered for protection or they're clustered. And so if you're gonna say to, to retain water or to stay warm or to protect it from predation or they're clustered around resources, okay? In this case, they may also just be clustered around trying to eat these barnacles, right? 
barnacles. Make sense? Okay. Uniform. What might lead to a uniform pattern? Yeah. Like if they all have their territories. Okay. Yeah. So uniform oftentimes happens as a result of of defense. Like they, they defend a certain amount of space around them. Could also result because there aren't resources there and they're just clustering for some other reason. Here, they're clustering for protection of their eggs, uh, but they don't, there's not a lot of predation. It's just a matter of just keeping them all together. Okay? Although there are some seals on the outskirts that will be happy to eat penguins. Um, but in here, the, the, the predatory pressure isn't real high. Have you seen like March of the Penguins? Or some kind of documentary on penguins. Happy feet. Happy feet. Happy feet works as well. Okay. So uniform is usually an illustration that there isn't heavy competition. There isn't heavy competition for resources. And then random. Now, can you see the wildflowers? No. This, this was a fun picture because I'm like, random. Wow, it's so random. There's nobody even there, um, but it's, it's the wildflowers. And so, but yeah, so random distributions, thanks, uh, random distributions you, you find most commonly in plants and it's usually just following the contours of the, of the ground. All right, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Well, in this case, these flowers are probably all wind dispersed, like dandelions, but it's probably, yeah, a factor of where the seeds ended up from wind. Yep. Okay? Yeah. All right. You're like, you've lost all confidence in me. I mean, I, I feel it. No, I feel it. I feel it. I will make it up to you, okay? I will earn. You will make it. I will. So give us all an A. No, I will earn your trust back. No, if I gave you all an A, that would not earn your trust. You would. No, I would no, 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 no. You think you would. You think you think you would, but you wouldn't. You would. All right. So another area under population ecology is the study of demographics. And so this is a um, basically looking at birth rates and death rates. Okay, that's the whole idea of demographics. What's the birth rate? What is the death rate? Uh, and then you can take it to the next level. You're like, okay, well, I want to know what is the birth rate and then what is the death rate at every age? At every age. Okay? I don't know why you would want to know that. Maybe so you can predict survival of these species. But... Okay. And so we can include all of this information in a single piece that's just called a life table. So all I want you to write from this, like y y you have these slides, right? Yeah. Um, all I want you to write from this slide is that life tables show the demographics of a population. That's all I want you to write. You're like, well, if that's all you wanted us to write, why didn't you put that on the slide? That's a great question. That is a great question. But I want you to have all of the information, but you're just writing down the key parts in your notes, right? You're emphasizing the key aspects. Yeah, as well. Show the demographics of a population. So let me give you some examples. Let's go back to our ground squirrels, right? We love our ground squirrels because they're like predator, 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 predator until they get eaten and they don't speak anymore, right? <laughs> Look at that. We got something. Man, I love it. We're getting... Oh, yeah. The mine? 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 Yeah, it would be really nice. It would have made that movie so much better if something would have come and eat. Eaten those seagulls. Although they flew into that... Into the sail. That was pretty good, too. Yeah, Mark. I think this is a squirrel trips just once. Oh, yeah. All right. So here's, here's a life table. Again, so... Here's the life table, and it's showing the demographics of the population. So it's showing birth rate because it tells us that the number that start at each age, okay? And so 337 start at age 0 to 1. What are we, what are we showing here? The, the number of born. Yeah, this is the birth rate, right? 
So we know if we have the number of individuals born and then we can compare that to the total number of individuals in the population, we've got our birth rate. Look at that. One thing represented on the life table, okay? And then what's another part of demographics in addition to birth rate? Death. death rate. And look at this, the number of deaths during the year at each age category. So of the 337 born, 207 die for a death rate of 61%, okay? And then of the 252 that started at this year, and you're like, wait a minute. How were there 252 if 207 died? Right, 337 minus 207, that's 130, right? Yeah. More than were born? No, because they were born at one year. This is at any, <laughs> remember this is, a, this is a snapshot. This is a snapshot. Meaning that the previous year there were probably more born if we know that there tends to be a 61% death rate, and we had 252 that were aged one to two years. Uh, it's an illustration, bless you. Um, it, it's probably telling you that this is an estimate from previous data or something, I don't know. You'd have to look in the textbook to see what that specific sign represents, yeah. So. Well, so this is a snapshot. So like at any particular time, this isn't necessarily following a single generation all the way through their lifespan. Oh. This is like if you look at this population at this specific time, there are 337 individuals that are 0 to 1. There are 252 individuals that are 1 to 2. There are 127 that are two to three at this particular time. Okay. So you could do a table where you just follow all of the individuals that are born all the way up until all those individuals die. Okay, you have those types of life tables, um, but that's not what this is. This is a snapshot in time. How many individuals are there at every, at every stage of life? Yeah. Is that like hard to do without keeping them in captivity? It's extremely difficult to do for animals. It's not hard to do for plants. So you can do it fairly easily for trees because estimating the age of trees is fairly simple. Uh, plus you can, you can find all of the area. There's only so far the seed's gonna get taken even if it's dispersed by animals. Yeah. Isn't the tree like the range? Yes, but you can also, yeah, but, and that's gonna kill the tree. But if you wanted to assess age without doing that, you could count the number of, bran of the times it's branched. So every year it should branch again. So if you count the number of trees and it has, you call those whorls, um, if it has six different places where it branches out at, then the tree's six years old. Is that like one branch? Well, it could be, uh, up at the top, it's, it's, there's probably only one that's left because it'll lose some branches. But at the bottom, especially, you know, now that it's six or seven or 15 or 65 years old, that branch has a lot of space and it could be dozens of branches, but they all branch at the same port, point on the trunk. All right? Okay. And you're like, well, what about a tree like this? You look out there and you're like, it stops branching at a certain point. And that's true. And then it gets a little bit more complicated to tell how old that tree is. Um, but there are ways you can do it. Anyway, I have no idea. That's yeah, a good question. But look at the death rate. In individuals 0 to 1, 61%. Death rate in individuals 1 to 2, 50%. That's lower, but it's not like way, way lower. And then 47%, that's basically the same as 50. 48, basically the same, basically the same. Then it gets up a little bit to 50. But it basically hovers around this 45 to 50% for five years of time. That's a relatively constant death rate. Yeah? Why does it fluctuate so much in the Yes. Yeah, so this first year is where you would expect to have the highest mortality because they're, I mean, they, one, they, their mom may not get enough food to actually give them enough milk that they grow well. They're the most subject to predation, especially right after they wean, right? They're the things that are probably going to be easiest for hawks to find and eat because they're not 
learned, right? They haven't figured things out yet. And then once they reach a certain age, you're, it's basically going to plateau until they start to get really old. Okay? And here it actually got really low, only 20% mortality rate, but then a 75%, 100%. Okay? But you only have one individual here, so you're like, oh, it's not very hard to get 100% mortality when you only have one individual. Okay? But you see, we've got a relatively constant death rate. Okay? That's an important aspect to keep in mind. So notice these are just female ground squirrels. Okay? Now let's look at it for male ground squirrels. What do you notice right away? Higher numbers. Higher numbers what? They die a lot faster. Yeah, their life expectancy is shorter than females. Uh, these numbers are relatively similar, right? It looks like about half of the individuals are male and half are female. But the males, their life expectancy is much shorter and their death rate is much higher and you get a spike earlier on. You're like, why is this? What is it about males? So here are our observations. Now let's 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 um, come up with a. The one, the okay. So the question: Are males more likely to to call out the presence of predators? Okay, that is a wonderful research question to ask. And then you could say yes, they are more likely, and then we can test that fairly easily. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. So the males invest nothing in parental care in, in these ground squirrels. They, I mean, they don't invest nothing because you're like, wait, they made the offspring in the first place. That's some investment, yes, but small. But they don't actually raise the offspring. Okay? The females nurse the offspring. The males don't go collect food for the females to enrich their fat reserves to make. They don't invest anything. Yeah, cop. Yeah, and so what you find is... And it, so your hypothesis then would be that males are moving more, therefore more likely to be preyed on, and that's exactly what you find to be the case. So we have a hypothesis that males are more likely to call. You actually find that males will almost never give an alarm call because they're never around close relatives. The females are the ones that give the alarm calls because the females all stay together and their sisters are all nearby. But the males move around in search of mates, okay? And so that lowers male life expectancy, but that's okay, because the males, like a good male that could survive, if you had a male that survives for six years, that gives him basically six or more breeding seasons. I don't know how often these belding ground squirrels breed, probably three or four times a year, but it gives him a lot of opportunity to have offspring, but he's always on the move always on the move, which is why their life expectancy is so much shorter, all right? But we still have a relatively constant death rate until they get really old, and then they don't move as fast. So as they're always on the move, you know, they get eaten more often, all right? Cool? Yeah. All right. So then what we can do is we can take these demographic data, and we can, we can construct a survivorship curve. So the key point of this slide, and this slide doesn't have very much on it, uh, but the key point here is a survivorship curve represents a life table. It represents the, it's a graphical representation of the demographics. And we all love graphs, right? We all loved algebra because we really first got to start to graph in algebra. And then you get to algebra two and you're like, man, I love this even more because I'm graphing more complex equations. I'm even starting to talk a little bit about imaginary numbers and imagine what the imaginary plane would look like. And then you get to pre-calculus and now you're really, you're graphing on the imaginary plane right next to the, the real plane. And you're just doing some wonderful things and you're like, I love it. So let's take biology and let's graph these demographic data. And here they are for the ground squirrel. So here is, over here, the number of survivors. And then here you can see age and years. And we have basically a line. Now the male, its line has a steeper slope, okay? A steeper negative slope than the female line. But these are all fairly linear, right? 
and you're like, well, it's not quite a line, it's kind of bubbled. It's biology, right? We can't have a perfect, beautiful line, okay? But this is roughly linear, this is roughly linear. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. This is what we call a type two survivorship, okay? And we'll see that. I'm gonna skip this one because it just explains it, but here you can actually see it. Here's a type two survivorship, and it is a line, meaning that the death rate is relatively constant throughout the life of the individual, okay? It's a type two survivorship curve. The death rate is relatively uh, constant throughout the life of the individual. Yeah? Is the third one an oyster? It is, it certainly is. So then we have a type one, where you have a really low death rate in the offspring, and then once you get to a certain age, then your death rate really picks up, okay? Humans are a good example of that, right? Relatively low mortality in offspring, and then de the mortality or the death rate really peaks up uh, later on. Type three, this is common for a lot of insects, common for oysters, crustaceans, things that have really small offspring and just thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of them, but most of them get eaten. Okay, type three, survivorship. Okay, make sense? Do we love it? Yeah. Yes. Do we hate it? No. All of it. I love this, Undecided. but I don't love that you keep making mistakes, Dr. Engel. Yeah. Can you explain the oyster one again? Yeah, so oyster, a type three survivorship, high mortality rate, or a, a very large death rate in the offspring, and then it slows down. And these are usually in animals that make a lot of offspring that most of them get eaten. So, we, Yeah, you don't eat the baby oysters, though, unless you do it by accident. But the adult oysters.